Okay, and that's a note for me. Don't forget to hit record. So my name is Jonathan Stewart, and I am a teacher specialist here in Canyon School District. And today we're going to be talking about, we'll be doing our bite-sized PD, and they'll be focused on classroom management, getting back to basics. Um, our professional development norms today, we want to be committed and focused. Um, allow others to speak and listen if we have any other joining us and make sure to ask any clarifying questions. Uh, be sure to mute your microphone and, and if you are comfortable, turn on your camera. If not, that's okay. If you have a question or comment, type it in the chat. I will have the chat up. However, um, so given that we have a small group, if you want to just go ahead and ask your question, that is fine as well. Just go ahead and pipe it in. Um, today, uh, we'll be focused on our multi-tier system of support framework, or MTSS framework. And we'll be talking specifically about student behavior, focused on the instructional priorities of classroom PBIS and positive teacher-student relationships. Though we will talk about some other things, including precision requests today. We we'll focus on those instruct high-yielding instructional practices that will benefit all students. Our learning and contentions and success criteria for today is I will be I will learn or be reminded of the three R's of classroom management. So rules, routines, and relationships. And we're hoping with the success criteria that you will be able to use at least one of these strategies that have been learned or be reminded of to strengthen classroom management in one of these areas, rules, routines, and relationships. So this is the agenda of what we will talk about today, the importance, again, of classroom management, and talk about those three R's, rules, routines, and relationships. And a quick reminder about what if charts and precision requests and how they reinforce those three R's. Oh, good. We will have someone else joining us. Let me get over here. Hi, Rachel. Looks like she's connecting right now. So when it comes to our classrooms and thinking about um, what we do in our classrooms, this is what we want. We want to be able to have that individual attention and sit down and we are able to work with kids. But when classroom management goes awry, this is more like what we will end up seeing. Um, and unfortunately, I feel like there are a lot of things that were out of the control of teachers in the last couple of years. And it led to a lot of factors where we, we probably had this feeling that as we were dealing with, um, you know, things related to COVID and pandemic and unrest and political issues, that this is probably how the feeling that we would get as a teacher. Um, some of that has changed, some of that has not, but one thing we can do is we can have control of what we do in our classroom. And that is where kind of getting back to basics with our classroom management and either doing things that new techniques, but I would say probably more going back to things maybe that we have done in the past or used to do. And now that we can have more focus on our teaching would be beneficial. Again, a lot of what we'll talk about today is not new. And I look at this as kind of a reset. If you think about this school year, um, COVID is not as prominent a part of our lives. And really, I feel like this is the first school year we've had where we've kind of been able to reset and reframe back to what feels like a more normal classroom experience that we've had in the past. And as part of that reset, getting back to basics can really help. And I was, as I was thinking about how we do that, I really feel like it sums up in these um, three areas that you could call the three R's. So first of all, talking about rules. Secondly, how we have routines and procedures in our classrooms. And then lastly, how we can cultivate relationships with our students. Um, first instructional priority and first thing we'll talk about is classroom PBIS. And that's really talking about the rules that we have. 
Um, you'll notice that in the slide it talks about rules, routines, and arrangements. And when we do these effectively, it helps us to say yes as a teacher more often. We'll focus today on rules and routines. Arrangements would be how you arrange your classroom or learning environment so that things are arranged in a way that are conducive to student learning. And I think, you know, most, most teachers will have that set up, of course, before the first day of school, but know that you can change that up at any time to make it work better for your students. Now, this is an example of rules that we might see. And there's some problems with this. Um, first of all, there's, there's a lot of rules. I'll be honest, I read this and I forget what rules are in the first column by the time I start reading the third column. So that's not great for our students to try and remember. But secondly, um, it focuses on all the things that you shouldn't be doing and all the no's. And, and while of course there are things we don't want students doing, um, the students that I that you work with that may have challenges or try and push us, they all make great lawyers because they are great at finding loopholes. So first of all, I love how she says, no coming in late, no coming in early. Um, and it says, no looking out the window. So I, I, I know students that would say, well, no looking out the window, but, but you didn't say I couldn't look at the wall. Uh, and we'll try and find these exception to these. Um, the other thing is that they're not very well defined. No dumb questions, no wearing weird clothes. Well, what does that even mean? Um, what is weird to students may not be weird to the teacher and vice versa. So that is not the ideal and not what we're looking for with our rules with our students. The rules we want are gonna look very different. First, I think it's, it's time to get back to basics, why we have rules and what the purpose is. What rules are, a rule is, it's a broad-based principle to guide behavior to help all students experience success. And this needs to be something that would work in any sort of situation. So as you think about um, your students and as they're coming in and out of your room at different times of the day, are there rules that would work in the morning as well as the afternoon, your first period and your last period? Are there rules that would work even in different types of subject areas? So if you te teach multiple subjects, um, are there gonna be rules that work say in a biology versus, you know, versus health versus whatever. And, and it's important to think about that because having consistent rules for you, even if you may be teaching multiple subjects might be important. And those rules also support relationships because it makes things safe and predictable. They teach, they, your students see multiple teachers throughout the day and will experience different types of personalities and learning styles. So making sure they know what's the expectation for your room is really key and important because having, having that predictability, they know when they're going through a passing period and walk into your door, they know what they're gonna be able to see. It's also really, really important for them to reflect and support school-wide expectations, but be specific. Um, so in your school, you may have, you know, Bruins are safe, responsible, respectful, um, ready to learn, kind, those, those tend to be some of the biggest ones they talk about. Having the, making sure you connect to what the school is trying to do as a whole can be very beneficial. Again, students are not just in your room all day. They're in the lunchroom, they have the other classes they're attending, they have passing periods. They may be in the gym for PE, they may be in the auditorium for a drama, they may be in the choir room. So they have a lot of different areas that they could be in the school. And the more consistency that there can be between those areas and the more consistency between classrooms, it makes it easier for students to re be remember and be reminded. And they're not having to constantly adjust, wait, and here it's one way and here it's another way. You still wanna promote behavior spe specific to your area. There are gonna be different rules like in PE, which I know Rachel teaches. Um, in math, in science, in the shop, there will be specific things to, to make that will encompass, for example, safety. 
So you still want it, it, it you still want it to, to match, but the more cohesive you can make it between the different environments, the better. And then having explicit rules. You want it, there can't be any guesswork. If we go back to Mrs. Muttner, weird clothes, well, what is weird clothes? Or be kind. Well, kindness is great, but that can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different kids coming from a lot of different backgrounds and home lives and life experiences. So having it be more concrete and mixed and specific makes for a greater opportunity for success. And effective rules, we've kind of referenced some of these earlier, do have these following five characteristics. First of all, they're stated in positive terms. You want, what is this, what do you want the students to do? Um, you can, you know, they can always do alternatives of that, but if you can bring them back to, you know, you were going over there, was that walking, you know, was that, you know, you try to get my attention in class. Was that raising your hand? Oh, no, I just shouted out. Okay, so next time when you want need to get my attention, you need to raise your hand. You need to be observable and measurable. Again, not that vagueness. Um, having things simple and age appropriate really helps. Um, you do have a lot of variance. You know, even in a middle school where you only have three grades, there's a big difference between a a student that just turned 12 and a student that's almost 14 and about ready to move on to high school. So because of that wide variety, um, it, the simpler you keep it, the better because your students will remember it, especially as they move across different periods. And then you only want to have a couple rules that makes it easier for the student to remember. And again, it's focused on what the student, not feelings and things, but on student behavior. These are the types of rules that you could want, may want to consider when you're creating these. And you may have, already, I'm sure you've already had this in your disclosure and are looking at it and looked at when your class, but, but think through, do I have rules around these? Whether it's compliance, talking, um, how you prepare, how you come to class. And a, and a great one is, rules or routines, which we'll talk about in a minute, around transition. Transition tends to be, that's transition between different types of activities. So um, when we're doing a whole group lesson to working to independently, or if you have them doing an active activity where they get up and move around and then they need to transition back to their desk to write a follow-up um, you know, reflection about their experience. That transition time, that's where teachers tend to lose a lot of instructional time. That also tends to be when students' behavior, because it's a little less structured and unsupervised, can be more escalated. So having some you know, clear boundaries and delineations about what is involved in transition can make, make a difference. And I love this quote from the Tough Kid New Teacher book. Do not ever make a rule that you're not prepared to consistently enforce every time every day. That consistency is really the key. There can be a lot of variabilities about the language that people use and what they emphasize, but it, that consistency will be key for your students. It's a trauma-informed practice, but more importantly, it just, it makes the students um, know when they come into your room, they already know what to expect, and it makes it easier on them. It makes it easier to comply with what you're wanting them to do. Um, this is a, a great quote I like to look at. If a child doesn't know how to read, we teach, swim, multiply, drive. You see the quote right there. I can appreciate driving as having two adult children that I help teach to drive. But if a child doesn't know how to behave, we, we teach, we punish. We... And this quote, as this quote, even though it's a little older, says, why can't we finish the last sentences automatically as we do the others? And if we think about rules and procedures and things it's not important to have them but we need to be explicit and teach them having demonstrations descriptions you want to give lots of examples and non-examples so they know like if i do this this works and if i you know and these are things that won't be acceptable that meets my standard give them lots of opportunities to practice oftentimes role playing or having them actually physically walk through it 
may seem childish, but really it just gives them the opportunity to be very clear about what's going on. And we know kids have different learning styles. So role play can be a great way to capture those kids that, that get things when they physically do it and practice it. Um, giving encouragement, feedback, and prompts. And then you want to give plenty of opportunities for continual feedback. This shouldn't be just a one and done. This, you know, we're, we're on Thursday of week one. So it, it should, the attitude shouldn't be, well, time the rules, they know them, they've got it. Um, it. There still should be, you should be able to be bringing back those rules, reminding kids as things come up about what the rules are for your class. They will those be, need those reminders, especially the first parts of the term as you get semester breaks. Chris, you know, a winter break, fall break, spring break, et cetera. When you have those longer breaks, those kids may need the reminders. Um, that, you know, when new students come in that can transfer into your class, that can be a great time to remind the students in that period of what those rules are. And as they have that extra practice, um, it will just help cement in their minds what you expect in your room when they're in, your, in with you. The next thing we wanted to talk about is routines. Sometimes these are also called procedures. And again, they allow us to say yes and say positive for their students more often. It's, our routines are just the accepted process for carrying out a specific activity. And really they help maximize time. Um, if you have 45 minute periods and I believe a seven period schedule fits that. If you have something that weighs 30 seconds to a minute, it's like 1 40th of the time that you have the students in there. So, so I know those outside of education don't quite understand, hey, you know, it's just a minute, but that's a long time, especially when that's repeated over the number of days that you are with them in a semester. And if you're on a block schedule where you only see them every other day, that becomes even more critical. And these routines and procedures similar to rules, it's just that support and scaffold to help students be successful in the classroom. Um, they, they're able to see and know that success. So we talk about explicit instruction. This is one of our instructional priority. And it's that I do, we do, y'all do, and you do. And that's how we do our teaching of, of math or um, how to solve an algebraic problem, how to, uh, you know, how to, how to use the, um, how to use the bandsaw and wood shop and whatnot. But that same process can be used to, that we used to teach academic content can be used to teach our procedures. Um, I'm sure that this week um, that Rachel and Serena, I'm sure the two of you have already done this. You've taught, when I want my assignments turned in, you pass them down the row, the person, the per student in the front of the road takes them to this basket or when your homework comes in this is where I keep the homework homework binders you take your homework you put them in here understanding that the procedures are going to be different in different classrooms in different areas and that's okay you just need to make sure that to teach your students what you expect of them and to understand that there's going to be changes and so that explicit teaching is going to need to be ongoing Again, you want to explicitly teach it. Don't assume the kids get it or they'll get it one time. No, you're gonna to have to come back to it repeatedly. How does it look like? What does it sound like? Having them see and hear what success is will make a difference. It's good to establish only the routines you want to reinforce. So if you have a, if, if you have a way of them passing out papers, but you don't actually reinforce that you don't remind students you don't praise when they do it correctly or correct when they need to do it then i wouldn't establish it as a routine um, really key on those key ones that are going to matter to you on the flip side and it feels a little paradoxical as needs arise you may find that you may need to build additional routines that you didn't anticipate for example, you may have your paper passing down, but man, they just don't know how to get their Chromebooks out for to work on this assignment. And you you had thought by just assigning them a number that that would work out well, um, especially with them having their own, but you're just finding this being an issue. So 
you may establish a routine realizing charging Chromebooks is a problem. So how do, how do I establish a way for them to um, charge a Chromebook in a way that's gonna work for me in my room? And again, teach, reteach, reteach, reteach. For the things you want to, you really want to reinforce and see happen, go over those, help students remember those, have students tell you what to do, have students teach each other. That, that teaching becomes a foundation so that you, a lot of time spent in the beginning of the year or semester establishing these will go a long way and you don't have to do quite the number of reminders that you need to do in other settings uh, as you go along. And it saves you a lot of time in the and aggravation in the end. Um, I will go here right now. Um, this is a link to a document that you can make a copy of and find on your own. But this is a list of classroom procedures. And again, we have some of these labeled elementary and secondary, but I think a lot of these things apply to multiple areas. For instance, if you're doing small group activities, what are some of the procedures you may want there? As they're doing seat work, as they go to the office, leaving for field trips, transitions, substitutes, what are the instructions when a student is absent? These are all procedures that, that again, I think apply across the board in education and all teaching settings. So what I would challenge you to do is kind of look through these. First of all, see what you already kind of have procedures for. Um, see if you feel like something's missing maybe for you. And as you go through this list, just, be, just do a reflection of, are there things on here that, you know what, they aren't working very well for me? Like that doesn't go as smoothly as I'd like. Um, maybe, you know, when students aren't sitting in their correct seat based on the seating chart, that always seems to be a struggle of how I handle that. Maybe I need, you know, so that could be something you could actually just establish your routine for and say, if you're not, you know, we're going to try something new class. If you're not, if, you know, if you're not in the, your assigned seat, like this is what's going to happen. You know, I'll, I'll follow these steps and I expect you to follow these steps, that kind of thing. You know, if turning in works a problem, maybe I need to, set, you know, reach out to some other teachers, get some ideas and establish a procedure for it and then teach your students. Especially since we're in the, you know, we're in the first week, kids are starting to get settled in the flow. It's not, it's not going to feel unnatural for you to teach them some additional ways to make the classroom um, one better. Again, you can either create and adjust the routine or just sp spend more time because oftentimes, you know, we're in the first week, everyone's happy the first week. Oh, yeah. Oh, because they're just learning what they're supposed to do in your class. And usually, you know, by the second week, you kind of have, students get an idea of what you expect of them and they still learn pretty well. But later in the year, maybe after Halloween and they've gone to Halloween parties and whatnot, and they're, they've stolen, they, they've either gotten their own candy or taken some from their siblings and they're all hopped up on sugar, they may need some um, retraining and reteaching on the procedures that they got in August, but now in October, they need some reminders, they need some refreshing. Same with, you know, if there's a changeover with a lot of periods and semester breaks, that's a great time to reteach even if you have largely the same number of students. Um, that, that can make a big difference there. All right, and the last thing I wanted to focus on quickly before our time is up is teacher-student relationships. First of all, this is the main reason we're in education. Um, when you have that relationship of trust, it not only helps with student compliance and them listening to your directions because they kind of have that trust with you, but you're able to persuade them to try things they would not otherwise try. This gives them the opportunity to, you know, to experience grit and persevere and have that growth mindset and all those aspirations and skills that we that we want our students to have so they can be better prepared to adapt and be good citizens and uh, productive citizens in our society. And if you can build that relationship of trust, that's where you can really push students, persuade them to try things, um, 
You know, they may think they can't do an activity, but you can really encourage them to do that. And your relationship is where that really comes in. And how we talk to students can really have an impact on how that relationship develops. Um, this is a book that I uh, am, am working with. So I'm in charge of the STEM program for brain boosters in elementary schools. And this is a, a book that we're doing as a book study together. But it has a lot of great things in here. And I'm going to pull some things from it because I think it's things that all teachers could benefit from. And you see the quote there. Teachers' words have tremendous power to support a child's academic and social learning. Positive teacher language, professional use of words, note, and pace that help students to do, accomplish what they can in your special area. And I would say your subject area to make it relevant. See themselves as capable members of a learning community, building relationships with you and also their classmates, um, which as we know, like that can be just as important in middle and high school and engage their work with attention and enthusiasm. So the first thing I wanted to talk about was reinforcing language, making sure we use language that will encourage what we want students to see. And that you could also have probably heard that as praise, but really it's just the language that helps to reinforce the things we want to see. And ways to do that more effectively are to focus on behaviors that are working for a student. Um, making sure to focus on giving specific, not just great job, great work. You know, those generic compliments can work, but if we have more focus on, hey, I loved how you got right on the sentence starter today. You know, nice, nice job adding that extra sentence in the paragraph or putting the balls, balls away in the cart. If you can focus on the specific that goes a long way that tells the student that you, you notice enough to notice what they're actually doing. Um, and it'll help you know that they're, you're paying attention to them and that what they did was noticeable. You know, that in reinforcing language can help students move past challenges. Also those leading edge behaviors. So if a student's going out and taking a risk, an academic risk or a, you know, something that may, may be challenging to do in front of their peers, when you reinforce that, that can really um, motivate and, and encourage others to take that risk as well. And you can reinforce what they've learned in their learning histories as well. Again, you wanna be respectful and use that warm, encouraging professional tone. Maybe the coffee has, and the caffeine hasn't kicked in in the morning. Maybe you're, uh, you know, you didn't sleep well that last night and you had a rough morning. You, you, you almost need to kind of be that actor up in front of the class. And even though you may want to, you know, you still want to stay positive and have that encouraging tone. I think it's okay to let students know that everyone has bad days and that includes you too. But the more you can kind of almost fake it till you make it, fake it till, you know, you, it keeps that positive attitude and helps you to have that good attitude in the students so that your language and your appearance can really match what you want to do. Um, that avoiding naming individual students as an example for others, that more, has more to do with like, if you call the, the same students all the time, they get embarrassed, especially as you get older. And, you know, you want to kind of spread that out um, so it doesn't look like you have like a teacher's pet, that sort of thing. Now, reminding language, um, this is where we probably want to give our prompts for what we want students to do, that you would use that more in independent work, transitions, whole group. You have those times where you really need to just get information and get them to the next activity or working on the next problem or that sort of thing. And that's when you're going to do those reminders. Um, so how do you use that effectively? Well, you want to have clear expectations and have talked to them already of what is expected. And that gets to those rules and those procedures. Um, keep everything positive and keep it brief. You don't want to belabor the point and keep going on and on or the kid's going to shut down on you. I wanted to talk briefly and our time's just about up. So just got a couple minutes left. So I'm actually going to get off the PowerPoint. 
And I'm going to share. Oh, let's see, is it on my camera now? No, 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 I'll stop. There we go. Um, okay, we're going to go here. I'm going to use my technology correctly. I wanted to talk about a couple of strategies, and they're things that we use in the district that really can tie all of these things together. Now, if you haven't seen these before, you know we have the what if charts. I'm not sure this may look a little backwards. Not sure whether the image is backwards for you or not, but essentially the what if chart is is letting them know if I what kinds of things can I expect if I do what I'm expected to do? You know, like a PBIS rewards badge scan. Do you have a tangible prize? But also, you know, it doesn't have to be tangibles. I think having that reward be as natural as possible makes a big difference. Um, you want things that aren't going to cost you a lot of money. Free time, privileges actually go a long way. Um, special statuses, things like that. I always think about like punch cards or, you know, I've flown, I flew, happened to fly a lot this summer and, you know, you get the Sky Miles reward clubs and things like that. It's amazing what throwing a red carpet and having a shorter line can do for people's morale. And then when it comes to corrective consequences, um, and these again are in the slide and, and I'll post that later, you want it to be done in a hierarchy. You don't want to go to the bazooka as the first thing. You want to start with a warning and et cetera. An increase in severity only is needed. Another key thing here is make it inconvenient for the students not the teacher. If you are having them come in for lunch detention, understand that that will interrupt your lunch. And so is that an inconvenience you want to take on as a teacher? Or maybe it doesn't bother you, but for a lot of people, they probably want to have that duty-free lunch. And that would interrupt that for sure. So that's something when it comes. So the what if chart is a tool that really incorporates all these. And as you have these clear and post it and you tell your kids what, what's on your what if chart, it again, builds that predictability and that really helps the relationship as well. Uh, let me go back to sharing. We've got one more thing and then we'll be on our way. Last of that is the precision request. This is a, this is a chart that we can use to represent it, but basically it's a way of, oh, Basically, it's a way of giving directions. Um, so it can be more specific. This is a great one you can do with your whole class as well. Basically say, you know, give the student, please, you know, take out your book. Then you give them wait time, walk away. And if they don't comply, you say, um, you know, Susie, I need you to get your book out. When you use that plead, please and need language or I need, that will be cues and triggers for the kids. Hey, I'm all, you, know, you teach it to them ahead of time and you say, I'm only going to ask twice. It's only going to happen two times. And then we'll go to our what if cart and use the predetermined consequence. Again, it gives predictability for the student. Um, and it also helps you to know so you don't have to think about, you know, when you're when you're telling the kid to, you know, to write, write finish that problem for the 50th time you don't have to be thinking about and get emotional. Your system's already set up and you just trust the system that you've created. Um, we do have these posters. There's a printable right here and there's a video and example of what it looks like. And this was done in a secondary setting. So it can give you some ideas. I'll stop there. Serena, Rachel, since you're with us with me live, um, are there any questions, comments, things you wanna bring up before we end today? I have a question on the Google form for this presentation. Yes. Uh, I don't know if you have the answers to that, but I'm wondering, can I submit a Google form at the end of each one of these sessions or do I have to wait till the end of the month to submit it? Oh, no, you just submit it at the end of each session. Um, oh, okay. And you can go back and watch as many of these as you like. You'll get relicensure points. For those so if you if you watch five bite size pd and submit a form for each um the month thing is just we won't 
that won't be responded to right away. It's just that once a month, someone will go in and look and see what's done and then award the credit in Midas. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Not a problem. So you, Rachel, you got us to our last slide. So I just got to talk about it real quick. Um, this is Canyon G where you can find lots of great things on technology, instruction, et cetera. And we're adding, we, we keep adding to it as things get updated and we need more information there. This is our specific phase for a bite-sized PD. And as I referenced, there's lots of other subjects and topics that we've done over the last couple of years. Um, you can find a wealth of information on there. And then Rachel, that's the form you mentioned for the relicensure credit. You get um, a half of half a credit of relicensure credit per bite size PD that you submit a form for. So with that, we have any other questions or comments for today? I thank you for your attendance and we're so glad that you joined us today to get back to basics with classroom management. Have a great day and I hope you have a great school year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.